I see it much more as generational wealth now. There's the arbitrage of like almost no one gets it to the majority of the world will get it. I got rid of all of them, converted every coin I had into Bitcoin. So I'm 100% in Bitcoin now. There is nothing else. It is the currency of the internet. This is a train that I need to be on for my life, my children's life, my family, my future generation. We need money to be linked to actual value. I'm a definite hodler. I'm no intention of selling whatever happens to the price. It's about protecting my personal wealth and my family's wealth as we get older, making sure my children can buy a house hopefully one day. You lived through the digitalization of music, so like from physical music to the digital music. I, I thought like that could be an interesting starting point because we kind of live through uh, digital like digitalization of gold uh, because a lot of people call Bitcoin a digital gold. So I think like there's something similar happening, even though uh, Bitcoin is quite different to, to gold in a lot of aspects, but the fundamentals are actually quite uh, similar. Um, but before, before we start into that, um, how did you experience that shift from physical music to digital music, maybe also with the internet adoption and that because you lived actually through that and uh, I only hear it from, from, from people telling me about it. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was a really crazy uh, period. So I was running a record label. We were putting out um, albums, vinyl, CD, and digital was just this noise in the background and you'd release an album, we'd sell 10,000, 20,000 copies of CD. Um, and then this thing Nap called Napster started. You kept hearing about Napster and um, didn't really understand what it was. I think it was sort of peer-to-peer, -peer, essentially stealing music. That was initially how it was. It was free music. You don't need record labels anymore. And when you're running a record label, that's quite a challenging thing to, to face. And initially, we kind of just saw it sort of bubbling away in the background. And then people that then what happened was there was a really slow decline in the sales of physical music. And so I noticed that our album sales from some of our bigger artists would drop. So you would always sell 20,000 uh, 20, is not very many, but it's, it's enough for an artist to live on. And so you might sell 20,000 the first record, and then the next album would be 15,000. Like, well, is the album just not as good? And it was all at the same time. So this is kind of the the very um, late 90s, you've got Napster coming, all these digital services coming, and we suddenly saw a huge drop very quickly in vinyl sales. So we would release, we were selling dance music records, put a vinyl out, sell 5,000 copies, and then very quickly went to selling 1,500 copies, and then 1,000 copies. And you found out what the people were doing, what the DJs and the fans were doing, they were just stealing the music. So... They would find it on a streaming website somewhere and the well, I don't need it. I'll just keep a copy of it digitally and I don't need to buy it anymore. So it had a huge effect on, on our, our business and we saw a massive drop in income, um, huge drop in sales to the point where it almost became uh, uh, not viable to run the record label anymore. And I was running a small independent record label. It had a huge impact on the big major record labels as well. And the, the staff levels dropped dramatically from the record labels. They're back up now because of digital, but there was a huge layoffs all over the industry as people got their head around this thing called free music, um, which, which was difficult. I was also, I was a director of the official chart company in the UK at the time. And we were running panels with all of the major record labels, just talking about how are we going to cope with this thing that's coming? And none of us really could see what was going on. There was no Spotify. There was no none of these sort of legitimate services at, at that stage. So yeah, we really lived through through the hard part of it. And at the same time, the internet was developing. So you've got this perfect storm all, all at the same time. And my business, the way we got out of it is we, we were very early to e-commerce in music. So I set up a, an e-commerce website called recordstore.co.uk back in 1998. In fact, I'd set up my first e-commerce site in 1997 for my record label. Um, and what happened there was we didn't start selling digital music at all at that stage. We were still selling physical music, but we sold to a wider audience because instead of just selling to fans in Europe through record shops, we were able to sell through our own website to fans all over the world. And so that, but that was that shift. The digitization of music took a bit longer. We did start selling digital music in around, I think around 2000, and Record Store, my website, we were the first website in the UK to sell physical and digital music together. So you could buy an MP3 and a CD and a T-shirt in one transaction. 
but it was really low level because people are, why would I want to buy an MP3? I can just get it for free from Napster. Yeah, so that was it was a very challenging period and, and we were essentially saved by our e-commerce operation. I mean, I had to trim down the size of the business. I couldn't pay the artists as big advances. We had to let go some staff, but we, we managed to bounce through. And then around 2000, we, you saw the internet was really going to be something. In fact, one of, my, uh, one of my staff brought me a book called The Death of Distance, which is worth reading if you ever find it. And it was about the forthcoming revolution called the internet. And I read it. This is probably 98. Uh, in fact, he came to me and said, we need a website. I'm like, what's a website? What do I need a website for? And he explained it to me and we built the website and then we had this website and I'm like, great, it's just a picture. And then it, I said, well, couldn't we get the fans to buy things from the website? So we built a really rudimentary shop and that was the very beginning. And then in the next couple of years, I managed to sort of take the idea out to different people in the industry. And I started running this e-commerce shops for bigger artists. Um, starting with, well, very big artists like the Beatles, the, the um, Robbie Williams, Queen, and that was what rescued us. And we sort of moved away from being a record label into becoming purely an e-commerce operation. And eventually we shut the record label down. Mm, and, and now it's uh, like, it's now it's not operational anymore. No, the record label is okay. not operational anymore. I mean, the, the content is still up on all of the streaming services, but there's no new music coming out of it. Ah, okay. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting time because you really live through like <laughs> the, the shift of something. There was something existing. All of a sudden, new technology comes out, which makes the the old thing not completely obsolete. There are still like collectors who enjoy like uh, uh, physical forms of music, um, especially with the the big plates. How are they called? I forgot the name. Vinyl. F vinyl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, 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 what we call the record. Yeah, I, I never used them, so I don't even know the German word for it, uh, and uh, not not all, not even the like. I think I saw uh, a record of vinyl in my life, maybe like three, four times uh, in my life when someone gifted it to someone else on Christmas. I saw it because there was like an uncle of mine getting it. He's like crazy about them, uh, but but usually like. <laughs> Like like ninety nine point nine percent of my life is like uh, only digital music because I lived in in this uh, in this world, but it's it's crazy that you did that uh, pioneer work kind of in the in, in before two thousand even with building the website and, and doing all that stuff. What are some of the the learnings that you learned in that time that maybe is now uh, interesting for Bitcoiners and and people that are pioneering now in the Bitcoin space uh, uh, relevant? I mean, I think the importance of a of a a sort of complete holistic strategy for, for global. I mean, you've got to remember when we built the first website, there was no social media. Facebook didn't exist or it may have existed in its infancy. So um, I, if you're launching a, a Bitcoin brand, you've got to think very much about website perhaps being the core of it. You still need to build an email database. You still need to all live what would be considered old fashioned now as a way of extending, but it's so much broader now because you've got the reach of all of the different platforms. You've got to think very much about, um, I think, I think things will change. You've got to remember when we were doing it, there was literally a couple of top level domain names, .com or .co.uk. Now there's gazillions of them. You get .gaming, .everything else. So the web, the web page was a core part of it. The other thing is mobile didn't exist because the iPhone hadn't come out. So, we weren't building websites for um, different screen sizes. So you've got to think now about optimizing for all the different user experiences. Where are your users going to be? So that how can you reach them regardless of what platform they're using? And that was a really interesting curve that we went through because all of our websites were designed to work on a, a, a desktop or a laptop. And then in, mobile sort of came out of nowhere and you suddenly had all of your websites that look terrible on a mobile phone because, you know, a mobile screen is much smaller. And then we had to, I can't remember what it was called, responsive design. So my design team then in, started working with their skills to introduce responsive design on the websites where they resized the websites to fit mobile devices. And then you had to work with the, the banks to allow... So our credit card payments were processed by a company called WorldPay. They still exist. They're one of the big guys. And they, their checkout only worked on a computer. And suddenly we're, you know, you're, you've got people buying through these little screens. So I had to work with 
the banks and well paid to just go, you need to, you need to allow us to let customers pay on a mobile phone. I remember when first talking to them about it, they, they, they literally had no idea what I was talking about. Interesting. Is that uh, experience that you made uh, through the music and the websites and the internet adoption made it this easier for you to understand Bitcoin and, and get how disruptive yeah. it could be? Yes, absolutely. So I think I've always been very entrepreneurial. So I haven't, so I have had some time in big corporation, but most of my career has been sort of, um, entrepreneurial and looking at what's coming next. I mean, we were very, very early in the internet. I mean, if you think, I think Amazon was around 95 and our first website was 97. So we were very early and you can see the, the huge resistance. I remember, I remember I, uh, when we started offering our service to other record labels. So we did a deal very early on with a brand called the Ministry of Sound, which was a big record label and big club in England. They got it quite quickly. And then I would go to meet other record labels and explain what we were doing. And they literally had no idea, no comprehension, a bit like talking to people about Bitcoin now. So they, they look at you blankly and they're like, what do you mean you, you, you're going to sell the records over, over a computer? I know it sounds so ridiculous now, but it was such a conceptual shift for people. And, and Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's the same. I mean, I have conversations with, I, my friends call me a Bitcoin bore and they're like, just, we don't get it. It's all going to crash. It's all going to zero. You're wasting your time. I have that conversation so often. In fact, I've generally stopped talking about it now, or though my family probably wouldn't say that, but, but yeah, I, I can see, I can see it. The similarities are very stark. I mean, does that mean that's not the right word? They're very similar. They are very similar. Yeah, it's it's, it's super interesting, uh, but it gets more. I I uh, just yesterday I had a conversation, a lovely conversation. Uh, the boyfriend of my sister's. Uh, and he has an uncle who was like, Hey, I, I want to do invest in Bitcoin. And they're like, Hey, my, my brother in law is like this, this weird Bitcoin podcast that you should talk to him. Uh, so I had never contact with them, with them before because they're really like far out, uh, families. And we just had a, a quick, uh, um, Google Meet call and they were like, Oh yeah, we're really concerned about the euro. And, uh, I don't know about Bitcoin. I don't know about gold. Like, but we, we're really concerned with where the, the future is with, with the euro and wh what's the future with, with, uh, fiat currencies. They did not say fiat currencies, but they said like the euro, the, the dollars and stuff like that. Uh, so obviously they had, they really had the, the concern of, of that. And they were just like super normal. Uh, they have normal jobs. They're like, uh, almost 60 years old, 55 or something like that. So like almost like more and more people get it now, like normal people, not, <laughs> not like freaks, like, like, like me or something like that, uh, get it now. Like people actually, uh, see the problem more and more. We're like, oh yeah, yeah. Euro, like the, the purchasing power is really going down. Um, we hear more and more, okay, how long will the Euro be, be around? It's, it's not a good experience till now. Uh, so I think I have a lot of hope that through the pain that the fiat system causes, that the people actually start slowly to, to wake up, at least like what, what I see now, obviously the, the rising price. And now kind of, I think we are the starting of a major pull market probably uh, again. So this, this will also pay in, in that. So like the, 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 the stick of the fiat currencies and the carrot of the Bitcoin price <laughs> might yeah. bring, bring people there. But I, I hope, I'm very hopeful that more and more people now wake up to, to that reality. I, I think they do. Um, it is interesting because I'm in that age category and um, I, the, the, a lot of people in my generation um, have money. Most of it's tied up in property. Um, but they're looking at this, you've invested in the stock market your whole life, if you've bought a pension, if you're lucky enough to have something like that, and then this thing comes along and you see this growth. And um, I've got a lot of friends who work in the banking sector and they, so far, they're all dismissive of it. I haven't had any one of them just go, yeah, we should look at this. A couple of them have gone, I'm not sure I get it. Um, it just doesn't feel right, but they haven't investigated it. So... I lace it into conversations when it feels right, just to get people's take on it. Most people are too busy, I don't know, uh, watching crappy TV programs, worrying about their own life, worrying about the war, war and troubles and everything else. And it kind of passes them by. 
it was quite a surprise when I went to Bitcoin Amsterdam how, how big it was. I I was I was a bit taken aback about how big the event was because I'm I you know walked in I'd heard it might be quite big to see that that huge arena and like three what was it five thousand people or something like that and you're like okay this is this is not a fringe thing anymore this is and also if you I don't know what you felt but you looked around at the people there and the age demographic was very wide. It wasn't it wasn't just young kids in skateboard shirts. It was I found it was mostly older people. I was really surprised at looking at the age thinking, oh, yeah, there are people my age who are here either already working somehow in a Bitcoin company or investing or looking into it. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, I, I suspect there will be more adoption as it gets noisier. I mean, the ETFs are obviously transform it transformative when it comes to increasing the noise um, with that generation about Bitcoin. I have something interesting maybe to, to share with you yeah. um, uh, about, uh, wait, let me quickly check. Can I share that? Yeah, I can share that. Uh, let's give that free. I never shared that on the podcast, but I think it would be interesting because it comes out a lot. I also, when the first time I got into Bitcoin and I got to a meetup, I was surprised that I'm the youngest guy there. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I've never seen that before. That's and, incredible. And I have quite, um, I, I think, a representative audience now because I do only Bitcoin content. Uh, and I have between like 50,000 to 100,000 monthly viewers. Uh, so I think it's it's quite representative of, of the space. And as you can see here, I have almost nobody that is under 18. And there are almost three times as many people over 65 than under 25. And I'm 26. So like I'm I'm like in the on the lower end of the spectrum. And if you see it, the the, the average age is around, around like 40 to, to 50, something somewhere along those lines. That's, that's uh, so, so so that's that that's what you saw in Amsterdam, I think is actually representative of the Bitcoin community. Yeah. And it, it quite literally shocked me uh, the first time I went to a Bitcoin meetup. And the second time it shocked me when I saw my own analytics for the first time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had no idea. I mean, <clears throat> you can understand from a financial perspective, most people under 24 don't have excess cash. You know, when I was 24, I was kind of, you know, living paycheck to paycheck wasn't very well paid some i managed to buy a house at the, but um that's when houses were a lot cheaper but um we yeah i mean that, that that demographic i think it's probably because people as they get older have invest some investment capabilities and bitcoin becomes a, a, a possible part of your portfolio if you hear about it i mean so many people have never heard about it i mean because I don't know what you're like, but because I spend a huge amount of time listening to Bitcoin podcasts and I've become really absorbed in it this year in particular. Um, and I see that many people literally don't know. I mean, I've, I still get the Well, it's just a Ponzi scheme. I, I still get that. Or I, one of my friends said the other day, I don't care about getting rich. I'm like, it's, it's a little bit. That's not really what it's about. So, it's, it, it's, it's about not getting poor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's about it's about you maintaining spending power. I mean, you know, these these people who have retired, one of my friends has retired on a really crappy little pension and, and his spending power is just going to go down and down and down because his pension goes up by 3% a year. So you can if inflation carries on, as we know, it's all way higher than the official figures. So if, the, if, if inflation carries on at that 8, 10% in, in 10 years time, he's really going to be struggling. And and uh, it's like Bitcoin is right now both uh, Bitcoin is right now not getting poor uh, and both also uh, getting rich because like this getting rich is like the adoption curve that we have because like almost nobody gets Bitcoin and there's the arbitrage of like almost no one gets it to the majority of the world will get it. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, the monetary pol policy is that what preserves and conserves your financial energy that's why it's so hard to explain like you, you, it's it's like you have a tesla stock in there but you also have gold in there it, it's like that that kind of two different kind of worlds where we have high growth high innovation high things that there's a lot of money and interest and in people coming in but at the same time it's very conservative from a base level from where it will go so 
it, I understand when people are confused, to be honest, especially if they are not deeply involved with it. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, the, the summary I give people at the moment is it's currently like digital gold. You've got to think about it as gold, as, as a store of value, but it will probably become a currency and a medium of exchange as well. But we're just not there yet. It's also interesting when, uh, because yesterday the couple, I explained them first, like why Bitcoin? And then they're like, okay, like, how do we do that? Like, where, where do I get Bitcoin? And, and I explained it to them, but it's, it's really hard to explain <laughs> in how, how you custody Bitcoin uh, yeah. and, and, and how this works and where the Bitcoin are and how you can re recover them. Like, these are all completely new things. You cannot relate it to anything else that they did before. So like, uh, education is such a crucial point. That's why uh, podcasts, and and being content creator and being a speaker and uh, being just an educator in the space is so important because we definitely need uh, those people explaining to everyone and we need the people like i had someone on the the podcast who just like runs around his village and and gets like normal people in the street talking about bitcoin <laughs> without camera just like uh, as a normal dude it's it's so great we need those people spreading the word uh but also like the content creators podcast hosts the speakers all, all the entrepreneurs in the space to explain to the world basically what bitcoin is and how, how we uh, keep it safe and how we can do with it that's that's so important i mean it is like you said earlier it's incredibly similar to when the internet first started people really didn't understand i mean i didn't understand i i you know i, I know we talked about it earlier but when when we built our first website i think it cost a thousand pounds and i could have released a record for a thousand pounds and i was like why did i waste a thousand pounds just to have this thing on a computer and but very quickly, you know, I think before that, when I first you need an email address, I'm like, I've got a phone and a fax machine. Why do I need an email? You've got to think that's only 25 years ago. And so that's exactly where we are right now. People are like, what? And it is hard to explain. I mean, it's, people think your Bitcoin is on your little ledger or whatever. But of course, it isn't. The Bitcoin is on the blockchain. But you try to explain. Yeah, <laughs> but. But it, it, it is such, such uh, as soon as you go down the rabbit hole, you're like, oh, Christ, how am I going to explain this? I really would love somebody. I've seen so many. This is the best description of Bitcoin ever videos, and they're all confusing. And I'm like, there must be someone that's going to be able to put one together that I can play to my mum and she gets it, you know, so. But that's the that's magic, actually, of it because uh, I think. We, we we don't need the one description. I think we need as many descriptions as possible. We need as many people explaining it to other people. Uh, and then, because like for someone, uh, I was a stock pro before Bitcoin. I was like really into stocks uh, and investing in companies. And that's why Michael Saylor made a lot of sense to me because he is used to play, uh, talking to retail investors and talking to investors in general because he has his own stock and his own company. Uh, but some of the other people, especially like uh, even like a Safadin Amuse, he didn't make sense to me. Like I was like, what are you talking? Now I get him. Now I really like, oh man, he really knows his stuff. But in the beginning, I needed the explanation of Michael Saylor to even get me into Bitcoin. And, and I think that's what I also try with this podcast because I have so many people on that have never been on a podcast before, like around 10 to 20 percent of my guests. And we have the science teachers on, we have the other people on, um, where they are just like normal people who have a normal job uh, and they have their view on Bitcoin. And then when there's like uh, another teacher, a bio biology teacher, and listens to that science teacher, and like, oh yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense what he's talking. But when that they, that teacher listens to Michael Saylor, like, oh, I cannot relate to that billionaire who yeah, yeah. issues convertible notes, which I yeah. have no clue what this even is. So I think we need as many voices uh, as possible uh, explaining and educating uh, and I hope I can uh, make a small uh, contribution with my podcast in, in, in that uh, and yeah it's re really really fun to, to do to be honest <laughs> yeah no no I think you do I mean you've got amazing ring of guests um, you know it's always always very varied that's what I like about your podcast huge variation it's not all the same many of the podcasts just have the same guests again and again and again and you're like okay that's uh, you know and yeah, you're also not, the, the other thing that's great is you're not selling anything. I know you've got the adverts in the podcast, but you're not out promoting something, which is, which is good. So there's no ulterior motive. You know, you are basically educating, which is great. Yeah, the, the, the sponsors I need to, to, 
and basically also make it daily yeah, <laughs> and, and live from that. But yeah, I, I'm not, I don't have a company. I don't have anything that I'm really like, oh, I, I want to sell this uh, other than maybe a, a Bitcoin t-shirt that I have on, but <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's not a lot yeah um perfect but one thing that i actually wanted to get to uh, when i mentioned a couple is the the last question they asked me was about oh w w will they ban bitcoin and <laughs> it's it's super interesting for me because i i don't ask myself this question any, <laughs> anymore it's just so out of the realm for me i'm so deep into the space but People who have not in the space that's actually concerned about them, especially now they uh, saw that the European Central Bank is writing something negative about Bitcoin. I don't know if they saw the, the recent thing that we also uh, should talk about, but they saw something. Uh, so it's still a concern for people. Um, uh, do, do you also see that? And then maybe we can get into the, what the European Central Bank <laughs> wrote with the yeah, distribution so of wealth. Uh, I think it exists at the back of my head slightly as a concern but because of the decentralized nature of it it's not in you know it isn't in one co uh, country it's a network it's almost like trying to ban the internet i think that's the best description when people say can they ban it they're like or ban electricity or ban wheels or ban fire you know it's kind of, of course you can't ban something that has this huge network effect you might through your own technology be able to restrict access to it in a country like china have done um, and some other, some other countries, but it cannot be banned. And and yeah, I mean, it, it, I cannot see any way. Governments are obviously terrified about it because it's out of their control. But when the internet came along, there's there's legislation and rules around the internet that help make it safe and all of this stuff, which kind of works. And maybe that's coming to Bitcoin. And perhaps that might not be a terrible thing because you've got uh, or a lot of the early cowboys involved, there was huge numbers of people that have lost their Bitcoin, been conned out of their Bitcoin. And you can see why um, it would be useful to have something like that in place. But as for it being banned, no. As for the European Central Bank's um, most recent attack on it, um, I, I think it's quite interesting. I've actually had some of those thoughts myself, like, I hear some people talking who were buying Bitcoin. Well, I bought 10,000 Bitcoin when it was a pound and you're like, or a dollar. And I'm like, okay, so you have a massive unfair advantage over me because you heard about it first. And the way I've rationalized that for me is the early investors in Google and Amazon and have exactly the same advantage. I saw a slide the other day. If you put a thousand, I think it was if you put a thousand dollars, excuse me, sir, <clears throat> if you put a thousand dollars into Microsoft when it IPO'd. That's today worth 5.4 million. I don't know if that's the correct figure, but it's something ridiculous. And the same with Google, same with Facebook. So the returns on investment for those people who knew about these companies or took a risk is enormous, but it's the same as the people who are at the beginning of Bitcoin. They took a risk. For a lot of these people who are, you know, the cyberpunks and the, out, the outsiders, if they'd spent $1,000 on Bitcoin, that was a huge amount of money for them at the time, no doubt because you didn't have Michael Saylor and people like that investing at the start. So, yeah, I think the, sorry, two answers. They, the, the European Central Bank paper was about the unfairness and a transfer of wealth to the original Bitcoiners. But I think they're missing a trick. It's just, you've got to think about it in terms of its investment return, like an early investment in a company, except the company doesn't have a CEO and no one can mess around with it. So it's almost like an early investment into an infrastructure. You, you were an early investor into um, the network or Cisco or one of the routers in the, in the internet. Is it unfair that you did that because you knew about it? I don't think so. I think they're just worried. I think they're worried about losing power. And if they don't control the issuance of the, of the money, you know, and I never knew any of this stuff until this year. I didn't understand money until I read Broken Money. And you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> That, that's hey. on the ECB.
I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. Yeah, it's super interesting that debate, uh, especially with um, early Bitcoin OGs, early Bitcoin holders. Um, I think most like, I think there's some f things that we even like have to clarify most of the people who bought Bitcoin in 2010, 11, 12, 13, 15, they have lost their coins in either an exchange going bankrupt or an exchange just stealing them, or they they did not take Bitcoin seriously. So they lost the hardware uh, device, they lost their laptop where the Bitcoin were on. So like uh, most of them like just like mistakenly misplaced them because yeah. they sold Bitcoin for 20 euros and all of a sudden it's like a few hundred thousand or a million even. So they, they didn't knew about the value necessarily which Bitcoin will have. So they, they of course uh, lost them. Then the second thing is even if they actually managed to hold them through exchanges crisis or other things, they sold the coins. <laughs> yeah. like, like you have imagined, like if you invest a thousand euros in 2000, I don't know, 12 in Bitcoin and you see your, your net worth rising up to 10,000, 100,000, 500,000. At some point you're like, oh shit, like I can buy a lot of things yeah. <laughs> yeah. With, with that. And then the third thing, even if like they never sold, they never lost it, they took a massive risk uh, there was a, like a massive uncertainty in Bitcoin. It's not like now there are a lot of Bitcoin podcasts. There's like a Michael Saylor out there. There's a new book like all those big people defending Bitcoin. It was it was the wild west, and you were listening to some uh, weirdos on the internet who maybe didn't even reveal their face and say like, "Oh yeah, it's a good thing. We we uh, we push." We're, we're going to push the central banks away. So like that, that was a, it, if you actually had the guts and the foresight to see that you deserve to be rich. Like, honestly, you, you deserve that. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, you know, it's the same thing. You, if you, when Microsoft IPO, would how would anyone know they were to become one of the most important companies in the world? Loads of companies IPO would around that time. Most of them have gone bust or gone nowhere. A few of them are shining stars, and it's just like Bitcoin. I mean, we should talk about Bitcoin and all the other crypto at some point because that's a quite a fascinating little subject as well. But um, yeah, did, did you wear other other altcoins? Me? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I got caught up into the whole crazy. Um, shall I tell you about my journey into Bitcoin? Um, so I kind of first heard about it. I think it was two thousand either fifteen or sixteen. Um, 
uh, a dad of uh, one of the dads at school, my, my daughter's school, was um, talking to me about it, and he said he's mining Bitcoin in his garage. And I'm like, what? L literally, what are you talking about? And he said, I've got servers in my garage, and I'm mining Bitcoin. And he tried to explain it to me, and I just thought, what, what an idiot. I'm like, literally no idea what you're talking about. Isn't, aren't you supposed to put your car in the garage? He's now worth hundreds of millions, but that's another discussion. But um, so I heard about it then, and then I kind of just, it was just this thing. I think I might have heard about it slightly earlier, but I just dismissed it, like lots of people. And then in 2017, I, um, I think on the, the peak going up, there was a peak around 2017, 18, I... Uh, I was working for a, a fintech uh, startup business and I, um, the CEO was really into it. And he's like, this thing's amazing. Look, I've just bought at 3,000, sold at 5,000 I've made. And so I was like, okay, well, that looks interesting. He showed me how to do it. I had an account with eToro and I set up an account with Coinbase, I think. I think Coinbase was around then. And um, I just thought, all right, well, I'll, I'll have a little dabble. I'll, I'll put some money in. I think I invested 500 pound. Um, I early, very early on, I realized you didn't have to buy a Bitcoin. I realized you could buy, they weren't, I didn't know the word Satoshi until this year, but I knew you could buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. So I did that. I saw the investment jump up and I sold it a, a, a few months later and I'd made a hundred percent gain. I was like, this is crazy. And the price kept going up. So I then bought it back in again, bought a bit more and then the price collapsed. And at the same time, I also bought Ethereum because i I had no idea that they were different. They were just all bucketed together. Cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, and all of these others. So I just looked at the charts on Coinbase. I could see the big, and I just bought all the big ones. I bought XRP at a ridiculous price. I think, I can't remember what I paid, but, but five or six times the current price, um, right at the peak in 2017. So I invested in, yeah, ETH, Bitcoin, Ripple, and a couple of others. And then it all collapsed in value. And, and I just, something in me said, there's might be something here, so I'm not going to sell it. Because it wasn't a huge amount of money. I put some money in, it had collapsed in value. I'm like, well, let's just keep it there because you just don't know. And that was a good decision, thankfully. Um, and then, then it sort of bumbled along and I just got, didn't really get involved anymore. Um, didn't look at it that much. And then around covid um i think i can't remember exactly when around the, the ico when there was all these initial coin offerings and meme coin things started taking yeah out. 2017 right was it was it that early okay I, I, 2017 was originally but obviously in uh 2020 2021 there was also a huge yeah, so uh, meme coins thing so yeah. the 2021 thing was when i really got into the meme coin thing i was working for a record i was advising a record label and there was a couple of other, other people in the company doing this and we're checking with each other what have you bought today what have you bought today oh that fun fair tron and just making these up i had absolutely no idea what i was buying but i'll oh, just a couple hundred pound in there a couple hundred pound in there thinking they're all about to just go stratospheric and of course all of them collapsed i mean i'm sure there is some value in some of them somewhere but i i just it was just number go up i was doing it to i was treating it as play money maybe I'll make a bit of money. And some of them did go up and I did exit at the right time. We're not talking vast amounts of money. Um, and I really started thinking, hang on, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm investing in something I don't understand. Bitcoin has not gone away. It still seems to be the biggest. I wonder why that is. And then COVID happened, everything completely collapsed. But the thing with the ICOs, what was, what was interesting, it became, and again, this only became apparent to me this year, that the whole ICO thing was getting the coin issuer rich and making everyone who invested poor. So if you got in very early, you you issued a load of tokens to yourself, you flooded the market with the tokens, everyone rushed in to buy, you exited at the peak. And that's how lots of people became multimillionaires by having a coin that had no utility, did nothing, just had a stupid name. And it's like, oh, how did I fall for that? As lots of other people did. So fast forward then to this year, um around the start of the year i was i I'd, I'd been on this journey i did a little course called the DeFi academy run by a guy called brian rose uh, in the uk and it was an education course on cryptocurrency and i wanted to kind of understand it a little bit more because i'd been through a couple of cycles and i thought i'll i'll do this and i'll really dig into it did the course 
And all of that is about, we'll give you early access to the next token so that you can be one of those people that sell the money at the peak. I thought, it still sounds a bit wrong. It just still doesn't sound right. That you, Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to make you on the inside of this game. And essentially, it became increasingly apparent that all of these coins were basically gambling, except Bitcoin. So I did that course. I sat with it for a little while. This is, I think, February this year. And I just... I then started doing a little bit of research and I found this the first time I met Michael Saylor, saw one of his speeches of like, oh, hang on a minute, this is this this makes much more sense. And then I saw a Jack Marler's uh, from one of the Bitcoin conferences where he talks about there is only Bitcoin. And then he talks about how Ethereum can just, uh, Vitalik can just issue more coins. And you start to really understand. It took me about four months to really get that Bitcoin was the only thing that counted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just, uh, for, uh -huh. for reference, uh, uh, I think this learning of it that you just described from 2021 to do here, uh, it's actually quite, uh, sorry, I didn't want to inter no, interrupt no, you. Fine. Uh, it's actually quite fascinating. We had like almost 70% dominance of Bitcoin. Yeah. And then in any one, and then yeah. all this craziness came out with that's the ICOs exactly, and yeah, stuff like that. That's the exact time, yeah. Exactly. And since then, it's kind of flat here and it's crawling back up the dominance of Bitcoin yeah. uh, since like this 2020 area. So I, I hope, I don't know, like uh, m m maybe this was the big uh, part where uh, this dot com bubble thing uh, in the 2000 uh, was yeah. coming, where all those crazy internet startups came up, and then like only a few actually made it through there. Uh, or maybe we still have it in front of us. <laughs> maybe the, the real ICO bubble and stuff like that comes up when Bitcoin is like 200k or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but as a reference, I just uh, sorry. No, didn't that's want to interrupt you. I mean that chart sums it up. I mean I. I things I could have invested into Bitcoin. I did invest into all these crazy meme coins. And I, I'm, I just sat down and wrote them all out. And why have I got all these coins? I don't know what they do. I've got no idea what they are. And within four months of doing that course that was to teach me to basically be on the inside of, of the meme coin or the altcoin thing, I got rid of all of them, converted every coin I had into Bitcoin. So I'm 100% in Bitcoin now. I'm, I'm not... I, I'm tempted because you see all of these stories about this is the next coin that's going to pop. But I'm like, no, be sensible. It's about the long term. This is not for the short term. I've opened Bitcoin accounts for both my children. I'm investing a uh, small DCA in for them. I've managed to get 10% of my pension moved into Bitcoin, uh, which my pension trustee is really uncomfortable about. I'm, they won't let me put any more in. But it just seems it's so obvious to me that all of everything else I'm not going to say the word is an S coin. So it's Bitcoin or S coin. And you have to go through it. I don't know anybody. I've not come across anybody that got it early on because they're bundled together. It's cryptocurrency and it isn't. It's Bitcoin and totally different things. The decentralized nature of Bitcoin is amazing. No owner, no profit being made, no company overheads. So there you go. That's, that's Bitcoin. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. I, I, I love it a lot uh, when I hear the stories because what I hear is like, oh, I came into Bitcoin or I saw the, the gains that other people kind of made uh, or like I wanted to gamble. Or I wanted to get into altcoins also. Uh, and then I realized, oh, only Bitcoin makes sense the, the more I actually educated myself. So that, that, that story is, uh, I think, First of all, I think almost everyone goes through that. <laughs> like almost everyone is like, ah, there's also the crypto things. Like I was also first in uh, investigating Bitcoin, then investigating Ethereum. I actually bought some. Uh, and then after a year, I was like, oh, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I put <laughs> everything in Bitcoin. I even had like some really small meme gaming tokens. Some I don't know. I don't even know what it, it is uh, till now. Uh, but yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's funny to see it. And it's also really interesting, this, this chart that I brought up the, with the Bitcoin dominance, uh, where we are right now with like 60%. By the way, there are stable coins inside there. So if you wow. uh, calculate stable coins out there, 
which stable coins are for me more feared than crypto <laughs> because yeah, they, yeah. they're bound to the, this. If you count them out, we are really like almost 80% dominance in Bitcoin. So it's like a really clear dominance. Uh, but even now we are 60% uh, dominance, even with the stable coins. Uh, and especially interesting is for me, of course, the second uh, or third biggest Ethereum uh, where we have since they switched from proof uh, of work to proof of stake, uh, they're just crashing against Bitcoin. It's super interesting to see. I think 2020, somewhere in the middle, uh, they switched. And since they adopted, it's just like a, a constant uh, go down. Uh, so I think um, it's very clear uh, from an educational and content standpoint that Bitcoin has won. But yeah. also now the free market and the, the capital markets seem to get it now. <laughs> the ETF oh, yeah, yeah. was another great yeah. example. How uh, the, the volume at the uh, Ethereum ETF and the volume at the Bitcoin ETF, that's two different worlds. <laughs> yeah, completely. I mean, I, the minute you saw, there's an amazing video of Vitalik singing at a conference somewhere and you just think, <laughs> and, and you just look that and you just think, no, I'm sorry, but no. But yeah, I mean, I, I also think, didn't they reveal recently that they issue lots of new ETH to cover the overheads of the company every month? A hundred, some ridiculous amount of money. And it's like, well, that's all you're doing is diluting the existing Ethereum holders by doing that. And all of the coins work that way. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm totally 100% sold on Bitcoin. There is nothing else in this space it is the currency of the internet absolutely yeah uh, it's, it's it's crazy to see and yeah it's <laughs> it's all uh, i love the memes online when when you see vitalik uh, singing somewhere or some weird position and and they're like yeah you, you put your whole financial energy in, in that one person and yeah they are doing uh i, I mean that's kind of what what the governments are doing also like they they are trying to run this system and then they are like, oh shit, like it, there's some emergency. There's like COVID, there's uh, war, there's whatever there is. There's some reason, um, like if you can print money uh, for an emergency for free, you will find emergencies everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if I had a business model where I'm like, okay, if there's an emergency going on somewhere, uh, I can print money. Uh, yeah, I would, I would go out and say like, oh, who, who has an emergency? <laughs> like, where is the, <laughs> where's the next emergency? So I think, uh, this, this incentivizing of finding emergencies is, is something, uh, really wrong with our system. And, uh, this is kind of probably also where Ethereum is now. They are like, okay, we have to run the marketing system. Them. So we have to dilute our own uh, shares, basically, and they will do it over and over and over again until yeah, they are at, at zero value and they are bankrupt. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Absolutely. Really cool. Uh, one topic that we also wanted to get into because we are already <laughs> approaching the one hour mark and we did not touch it, uh, touch on it. You said uh, you read a book about uh, MMT, modern money theory. Modern monetary theory. Yeah. Monetary but, theory. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, like, what, what is that? And, yeah. and then let's get into it. So I only heard about this uh, this year. Um, one of my brothers t told me about it and I read the book. And I just, so modern, the, the summary of modern monetary theater, as far as I can work out, is that if you are a government that issues your own currency, like the UK, um, I mean, Austria can't because you're in the euro. So like the UK or um, America, Japan, because you are issuing your own currency, there is no limit to the amount you can issue. So the debt doesn't matter. So the fact that the US is 35 trillion in debt doesn't make any difference. They could be a trillion trillion in debt and essentially modern monetary theory says that that doesn't matter the debt doesn't matter you can just keep issuing money now, so that ties to your point about needing wars and everything else and you you read the book and you sit there and go am i missing something here i mean to me it just sounds like complete nonsense um that a government can issue because it means that only a handful of governments around the world can actually do this and the rest of the world be damned so the whole, you know, if the if the US is the only country that can do this, all of Africa is totally screwed. Most of the, the, the rest of the world, because they don't have the power to issue their own currency or their currency doesn't have any value on the global scale. So 
it seems to be the complete antithesis of Bitcoin, where we've got the limited supply. If, as we talked about earlier, many of those early coins are lost, we may only have, I mean, it could be as small as 11 million left if 10 million have gone. I know nobody thinks it's that big, but it could easily be. We can't see, but let's say we'll go with the normal normal figure. 15 million uh, are available or either owned or still on exchanges or still to be mined. Um, that makes complete sense. Everybody knows what the rules are. The problem with being able to issue your own currency is no one knows what the rules are. And it's very clear to me now, having read all of the recent books, the Bitcoin Standard, modern, um, the Broken Money and various others, that all that's happening is creating inflation. So issuing money, the increase in money supply simply creates inflation that pushes prices up, that is causing the cost of living crisis and causing all of the issues. And so with modern monetary theory, I mean, frankly, you read it and you just... You, I'm scratching my head going, there's got to be something wrong here. Because she even goes to the point where she says, it doesn't matter about the interest because you simply issue more money to pay the interest. So you're creating money out of thin air to flood the system. And then when there's interest, you you just create more money to pay the interest. Now, to your point about it, we need wars and everything else, if a government can issue money to solve any problem themselves, why don't they just issue enough money to solve poverty? in their own country? Why do you even need a war? Why do you even need to tax anybody? If the government can issue the currency, there's no need for tax. They just keep printing the money. And so the minute you sort of dig into it, you're just like, no, there's something wrong here. So I, um, I'm going to reread it because I just, it didn't make a lot of sense when I read the book for the first time. Um, she talks about it quite often. It seems to have been a fad. Uh, I think it, I'm not sure when her book came out. It seems to have been a fad maybe five or six years ago where people were talking about MMT. MMT is the truth and all economic theories are before this are wrong. But I cannot, I, I just cannot see how it's viable for you to keep issuing money. It just doesn't make any sense. There's nothing backing it. MMT is definitely on the view that being tied to the, the like when uh, Nixon took a, took the US off the gold standard, the MMT's view is you don't need anything to back it. It's all just based on our choice. So the US government is is the backer of the money, and we can keep printing. It just doesn't make any sense. The 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 point is always for me like creating money out of nothing creates nothing like you 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 don't create any actual value so like uh we we, we need money to be linked to actual value uh and an actual physical things and with, with bitcoin we actually have this amazing thing where we finally solved uh, having that physical link of money that was like gold and other things uh, in, in the past with the digital thing created with the mining process because there's actual proof of work behind it yeah. uh, and there's just this limited supply and uh, because of the proof of work, because of the decentralized nature with all the nodes uh, running, uh, we can ensure that limit. So it's the first time ever we created this connection between the digital and the physical world uh where when uh where, where we actually have the um, uh, backing of real world uh value and real world energy and all those other things are not like that so no. we are just creating more money and it just uh creates nothing so uh that, that I, but i still have to read the book because i i think it's um, uh, really important to get into other theories and and see the theories of your opponent or of of your of other views or what of the opposition um, to actually see how they think and this either uh, makes you like oh I was actually wrong I don't think that will happen when I read the book but uh, rather than like oh uh, now I get how they think and maybe I can and then explain even Bitcoin better I think that that that's actually um we, we, i think it's really good to inform yourself around other theories also yeah. I, I love yeah. that you're doing that yeah i mean i i often look at negative podcasts about pop bitcoin because if, if you if you get caught up into the the echo chamber of only looking at bitcoin videos that are all talking about number go up bitcoin's going to save the world etc cetera, etc cetera, you can kind of get a little bit hooked in 
So I actively look at people who are like gold bugs like Peter Schiff and all of these other people who are basically saying Bitcoin's going to zero, it has no value. So that I try and get their view. I mean, back on modern monetary theory for a second, the I think your point about proof of work is the key thing. So when gold was backing the currency, there is proof of work. Somebody has literally dug a hole, mined it and taken it out. Somebody's worked to create that value. Now, of course, gold doesn't actually have any intrinsic value. It's simply a shiny rock. But because everybody agrees that it's very hard to get out of the ground, it's uh, one of the most precious, well, I can't remember the uh, properties of gold, but it can't really be used for much other than jewelry, some industrial use, but as a store of value. But the proof of work is doing it. And you're right, ish, a government issuing money, literally, right, we're going to flood the market with another $10 trillion. Click. It's, it's literally a click of a mouse. There's nothing behind it. So they are creating money. I didn't understand that when you go to the bank to borrow money, and let's say you borrow uh, half a million euros for a mortgage, the money doesn't exist until you take the mortgage out. I had no idea that that's how it works. I thought the bank literally had the half a million and they gave it to me to, so that I could buy the house. But they don't have the money. This fractional reserve banking thing, they, they have a small amount of the money and as they give you the mortgage, the money is created at that moment. It's like, that's just nuts. And that blew my, no idea. That blew my mind too when, when I got that. Like uh, when, when I, I think it was a short information video on YouTube, like a free four minute video. And I'm like, no, that cannot be true. That that has to be like that. They cannot just create money like that. <laughs> that 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 has to be fake. But it actually it's it's fascinating that th this is true. Yeah. Um. Before we get to the end routine, um, I have one more question, uh, which which sounds uh simple, but m maybe we can get into an interesting topic. Um. Why do you accumulate Bitcoin? Are you accumulating Bitcoin for like a retirement to increase your wealth? Like what 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 your what are you trying to um, get after with with accumulating Bitcoin, or maybe even for future generation? So to start with, I like most people who discover Bitcoin, I saw it as an investment opportunity. Number go up, which is a phrase I don't like, but um, I I thought okay, this is just part of my looking after myself in old age and everything else. I didn't, so it, it was interesting because it was on the edge. I've got a, a classic balanced portfolio, stocks and shares, and I've got no bonds, thankfully, but, um, and I don't have a huge pension, but I've just saw it as an investment. And then the more you dig into it, you're like, hang on, this is a bit bigger. So I'm now seeing it as, I mean, I'm a, I'm a definite hodler. I'm no intention of selling whatever happens to the price. Um, and I see it, much more as generational wealth now as this is this is um a train that i need to be on i need to be on for my my life my children's life my family my future generations so from a financial perspective i see it as building a war chest to uh, i will sell it partly if it's all i've got i will have to sell it to live on because you can't you've got to convert it to fiat if fiat's still around um so it's yes it's about it's about protecting my my personal wealth and my family's wealth as we as we get older making sure my children can buy a house hopefully one day you know i see it as that sort of helping set them up but then when you get into the broader aspects and you start learning about it being more than just about your personal journey it you can see how being part of the bitcoin ecosystem i i hear people talk about it make you think think much longer term and, and I see that in myself, you know, do I really need that thing? Whereas I could maybe buy a bit more Bitcoin and invest a little into the future. So for me, pro the primary thing is an investment vehicle um, and slowly transferring wealth across into it, setting up my children for the future and then thinking about, right, how, I mean, I'm actively thinking about how can I be involved in the ecosystem somehow to help spread it? I I no intention to to work in it at this stage, but it's just so yeah. It's in, investment. I think is the primary thing. The how it can save the world. I'm still struggling with. You often hear people, it's going to save the world. I'm like, okay, I can kind of see that. I haven't made that full leap yet. Yeah, uh, and and I think it gets sometimes too extreme. I th I think um, 
money touches almost everything or probably touches everything uh, in some sense. And of course, if we have uh, better money, we will have also better lives, but it doesn't like this fix the money, fix the world. I think sometimes is taken too far. Uh, uh, but it is true that uh, if you fix the incentive around money, that you actually get a lot of better outcomes, uh, at, at least like how I see it. Uh, but we, <laughs> we sometimes take it too far as a Bitcoin community. Yeah. All right, fix the money, fix the world. And then like, this is broken. Let's fix it with Bitcoin. I've yeah. got, but there's some truth to it because it aligns uh, the incentives and it's, it's really, really cool uh, to, to, to see that. Yeah, I think, I think the other challenge, of course, is the fluctuation in price. So for it to be, although that's how where um, gains are being made, for it to be used as a currency, that has to really flatten out. And I know it's um, legitimized in El Salvador, <clears throat> but I was reading an article the other day about it. And although it can be used, most people in El Salvador are still using dollars. And I think that because why would you spend Bitcoin today if it's going to go up in value? You'll spend dollars today because they go down in value. So I think that there's we're we're at that tipping point now. I know we have, everyone has these crazy numbers about a, a, a Bitcoin will be worth a million, 10 million. I've heard some people say 10 million, 100 million. But you think, OK, if it levels out at, say, 200,000, it probably will be more, but let's say it levels out of that. And then it doesn't fluctuate anymore so much. Then you can see it can then start to be extended and being used. You know, at the moment, but using Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee is probably a bit stupid it, because if if it is an increase in value, you want to sell the you want to use a currency that's going down in value to buy your coffee or don't buy the coffee and buy more Bitcoin. Uh, it's uh, it's ingr- it. I even think that this volatility might even go up a little bit uh, in, in the coming years uh, if Bitcoin actually follows that S-curve adoption, uh, which technology usually follows. Then if it does follow that trend, the next 10, 20 years will be crazy in, in terms yeah. of adoption. And then if a lot of people come in, there will be a lot of uh, uh, volatility. But I could be wrong here. I just think we are at such an early age and we, are, if Bitcoin actually is what we think it is, uh, <laughs> 99% of the people still have to come into Bitcoin. And yeah. Even the people that are into Bitcoin, they usually have like, oh, like 5% or 10% of their portfolio in Bitcoin and they probably come in with way more money than than before. So uh i think volatility is is there for a long time like i think that that's not something that goes away anytime soon uh we are we are, we are too early and, and too small for for that at least as as i see it yeah i think when you see that chart i can't remember who put it together that shows the value of everything the 900 trillion and bitcoin being one trillion of the 900 trillion you can see that it's still got a very long way i mean if it equals gold in the next 10 years uh, that that would be an incredible increase in value of per Bitcoin or per Satoshi. I think maybe interestingly that if we can move away from Bitcoin and move towards Satoshi, it will open it up to a few more people because people see the price of Bitcoin. So I can't afford that. But if we started pricing things in Satoshi's, people might think slightly differently. I think you mean that one, right? Yep. That's the one. That, that's from Jesse that's like Myers. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's from Jesse Myers uh, crosses yeah, also from you know, that, that your graph slightly old because Bitcoin's only 400 billion there, but nevertheless, um, yeah, that's, that's the one. True. So that's, it, that's, that's probably, I think that's the original one that he got out, uh, when I think he that's first got about it out. a year ago, isn't it? Because that was the market cap of Bitcoin about a year ago. I could be right, could be right, yeah. But but definitely, uh, that is amazing. And for everyone that is interested, I think Jesse Myers is uh, is an amazing uh, guy and has really good analogies. Um, I interviewed him actually, and this interview is on my channel, and we we talked about that and an updated model of that and where he thinks uh, the Bitcoin price is going, and especially he always puts it in perspective in what what else is on. <laughs> Uh, uh, on there and it, it was an amazing discussion so just like type in jesse myers uh, on on my channel and y- you will get to it um it's it's an amazing uh it, it was a really good podcast with him i i remember so where we uh, discussed that that very picture uh yeah it's 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 uh i think it's it's one of the best 
Bitcoin pricing models in terms of like what's realistic, because then you can actually put yourself together. Okay, how much of the wealth of the world will Bitcoin capture once I am 50 or 60 years old? And then you can build your own theories around that. And he he put a lot of work into collecting the numbers because it was not as easy to collect the numbers. How much yeah. is there in equities? How much is there in bonds and real estate and stuff like that? Yeah, no, it's a good chart. I like that one. You need to update that slide. <laughs> Absolutely. <yeah. laughs> it's uh, it's like uh, 400 uh, billion and now it's like 1.4, 1.3 or something like that. So yeah, it's like gold, massively gold's increased. Also 19. Gold's gone crazy this year. Um, true, gold, true. Yeah. Gold's up as well. Perfect. And yeah, thank you so much. I have one question that every one of my guests gets. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? <laughs> um, I can teach you how to um, make a record in a recording studio. I can try. It's it's not very Bitcoin friendly, and I haven't done it for a long time. Um, but yeah, no, um, yeah, just uh, that's a really difficult question to answer. Actually, Roman, um, I, 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 yeah, how how to. Very boring stuff. How to set up a business? Uh, how how to set up a business and all, all of that. I've run lots of different businesses, so just the things you need to do to set up a business structure and and all, all of those. Or I could teach you in a recording studio. Absolutely, I think that's a very important uh, f things to 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 learn about. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we better don't uh, get started with that, otherwise it's another podcast. <laughs> it is, yeah. uh, perfect. And yeah, thank you so much. We have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Uh, it's it's a similar question but different. Uh, what is more important to you than Bitcoin? My family. Oh yeah, that's that's an obvious one. Yeah, yeah, really cool. One. So yeah, there you go. Perfect. And yeah, thank you so much, uh, Russell, for for being on the show. Uh, where, before I let you go, where can people find you? Ask ask your questions. Well, the best me is actually LinkedIn. And I know most of your guests would say they've got their own channels and everything else. I don't. I do have TikTok. I'm not TikTok. I do have TikTok, but I don't use it. Um, yeah, LinkedIn is the best. Just my name, Russell Coulter, on LinkedIn. Uh, I've got quite an active page there. Yeah, most uh, guests actually say Twitter. I think like ninety-eight percent of them say Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I have a Twitter account. I'm not big on Twitter. It's just too much noise for me and too too much extreme opinion. I don't. I don't really want to spend my. I, I see people on Twitter and they're just obsessive, and I'm like, I, I'm too much. Too much real life going on for me for Twitter. I'm afraid. So yeah, <laughs> LinkedIn is the best one for me. Perfect. And I will link your LinkedIn profile in the description down below so people can directly check it out and, and yeah. find you. Um, also, I Googled you before and there's someone really famous with exactly your name who talks about aliens and stuff like that. I did not see exactly what he was, but I, I, I saw like some, I was like, oh, like interesting guest uh, that I have today. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I will put your LinkedIn down below so they don't confuse you. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think, yeah, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow for another episode. Bye-bye.